My name is Kirk Bachman, and welcome back to The Ultimate Dish. Today, I'm speaking with Jeffrey Saad, a successful chef, entrepreneur, author, and television host who is passionate about teaching everyday people how to cook locally and to eat globally. Chef Saad started his career, his culinary career, at the age of 13, working in a local diner. The hospitality bug hit him hard, and his passion drove him to culinary school and later to travels around the world. He has created and contributed to many successful restaurants, including San Francisco's Sweet Heat, Pasta Pomodora, The Grove. He's he's the author of Jeffrey Saad's Global Kitchen, Recipes Without Borders, and he has appeared on Food Network's Chopped All-Stars and Grill It with Bobby Flay, ABC's The Chew and Dr. Oz, as well as The Rachel Ray Show and many more. Join me today as I chat with Chef Saad about building an encyclopedic knowledge of spices and ingredients that inspires people to eat globally and much more. And there he is. Good morning. How are you, Chef? Well, I'm great now because you make me feel like I've done stuff. Wow. I'm, I'm out of, I'm, I'm I'm out of myself breath. now. I oh, oh, almost <laughs> dropped an F-bomb there. I'm out of breath. What a resume. What you a resume. efficient and focused. Thank you. I'm honored I, to be talking to you. I love it. The honor's mine. And uh, I got to tell you, you know, I, I'm excited for every guest, but you have an incredible presence and you're a storyteller. You're fun. I'm going to kick this off and get people really jazzed up. So I'm, I'm doing some research last night. And uh, I know you're supposed to be talking, but I'm going to talk for a minute. I'm doing some research last night. I'm looking at all these videos. I pull my wife over and I'm like, look at this guy. He is taking butter out of the refrigerator. He's cutting it up in cubes. He's putting it into a little vessel, putting the wrapper back on and putting it into the refrigerator. People are going crazy. <laughs> Freaking brilliant. My wife's comment as well. He's pretty good looking. And that's all I got out of it. That's all I got out of it. Man, it's so good to meet you. Well, thank you. Don't, don't upstage me. Love your style. And, 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 and it's addictive, right? But here's, what's going to be really cool. You don't know this about me, but you're born and raised in Chicago, right? Yep. Pinsdale boy. No way. No way. So same here. I was born at Grant hospital in the city, in the city. I love it. We, we left headed West uh, when I was 13. Where'd you go to high school? Hinsdale central. No way. Yes. <laughs> don't you love Chicago people? The you best, know. you know, I used to always joke because like when I would, it was in culinary school in New York, I'd go into the city and I'd be like, good morning. And they all look at me and they're like, uh, you're not from here, are you? Because yeah. in Chicago, <laughs> I made some of my best friends at the bus stop. You know, it's like everybody is full of joy. Like, hey, nice to see you. Everybody say hot dog. Yeah, hot dog. You're Chicago. Right there. <laughs> That's how you say hot dog. Oh, I absolutely <laughs> love it. I love it. So, so tell us a little bit more. I mean, there, there's so much, um, you, you grew up in Chicago, Lebanese family, right? Yep, you're good, so, yeah. So food, food a big piece, right? You know, it, it's amazing. I always joke that I was, you know, I was in seventh grade, and when you're 110 pounds and your sister can kick your butt, you're probably not playing football. <laughs> you know, I was like, I, in my mind, I was like a linebacker, but in the mirror, the reality was, I was it was not going to happen. So I went into this little diner behind my junior high school, and I grew up with my city, which is grandma and, you know, Arabic, sure. making yeah. all this food. I mean, I smelled cardamom and, and you know, phyllo dough being buttered before I, you know, smelled and remembered anything else. But I walked into this little diner. And I got a job as a dishwasher. And then I got promoted to cook with my little paper hat at flipping frozen burgers. And I'm like, I'm a chef. And from that moment, I was just addicted. I mean, there's such a joy to putting food on a plate, putting it in front of somebody, seeing them bite in, shut their eyes for a moment, look to the sky, and you've just fulfilled their day with, with a piece of food. Is that what did it? What, what, uh, so, so you're what, 10, 11, 12, 13? Yeah. And then- then it's in your mind. And, and, and then culinary school, school came into the picture. Tell me about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I, without a doubt, working in that diner, I said, this is what I'm doing for the rest of my life. I'm opening restaurants. I'm feeding people. I'm bringing, I'm vending joy with food. You know, life is so crazy. In the, and in general, you know, that's one of my tattoos, bring joy. It's like, if I can just I light it. somebody's light up for a few minutes, it's the greatest feeling. So I said, that's it. So then I started working at my uh, godfather's restaurant in Chicago, which was a riot. <laughs> and, you know, basically, if you had a recording of that kitchen, it would be symbolic of every lawsuit there has ever been. It's an HR person's nightmare, you know, but that was a different time. And uh, then I said, hey, well, if I'm going to do this food thing, I've been to a bunch of restaurants. I'm like, I should probably make it official and go to like, hotel restaurant school if I'm going to open restaurants. So yeah, I went yeah. to undergrad at Iowa State University. And then when I graduated there, I'm like, all right, well, I got to understand the kitchen because I 
as you know, Kirk, you work in so many restaurants and you see the owner being held hostage by the kitchen because they don't know what's going on or the chef's frustrated because they don't get it. So I'm like, I'm never going to be that guy. I need to get it. So then I went to the CIA in upstate New York. Amazing. And it just continued from there. So you, so you were a cyclone, kind of similar path, right? I, I went to the University of Oregon and did everything I could not to be in this industry, right? So <laughs> grew up in it. My father's a master pastry chef from Germany, the, the whole bit. So I'm, I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to be a lawyer. I'm going to do anything I can, but it sucks you in though, right? It chooses you. It's like it, it is in your you. blood. Yes. When people say to me, should I open a restaurant? I'm like, do you wake up in the morning and the first thing you think about is like, what am I going to cook for breakfast? What should I do for lunch? Should I head to the farmer's market? All I want to do is cook and take care of people and work 16 hours a day. And they're like, uh, maybe not. I'm like, exactly. <laughs> you know, because as you know, even when a restaurant goes really well, you're not getting rich. I mean, you're going to have a good life and you're doing what you love to do. Yeah, but that's yeah. what Which I always tell important. people. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, yeah. I always yeah. tell my last restaurant failed. And I told my my son and my daughter, I said, I do it all over again because I loved the journey. I was happy every single day. And if you're only doing something for the outcome, it's a sad life. If you're fulfilled by the journey, then there is no losing. It's It's great. Great role model. I love that. So you ended up, you ended up, I happen to know at the California Culinary Academy, CCA, as we, as we all know it. Um, and, and a, a few years ago, right? So um, classic, classic West Coast culinary school back in the day, right? And um it, so I have to bring up a couple of funny stories. So it's in the Tenderloin district, Polk Street, right? Right. right. Beautiful, beautiful part, the heart of San Francisco. So I I, I could remember the first time that I went when I was working with another organization that was operating that school and people were like, yeah, you're, 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 you know, you're staying at that holiday Inn," which I could see from the school, but they're like, yeah, you're going to want to get a cab. And I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> well, it's the, it's the Tenderloin district. And I'm like, okay. And so, you know, I got up in the morning, started walking there and I realized, okay, I'm gonna <laughs> cab, I'm going to grab a cab, right? This is a little, little crazy, but Somebody told me that it's called the Tenderloin District because back in the day, it was a little tough area of town that the police department would give a full on tenderloin. We got to love this as chefs to any any cop that would work that beat. No, 100 percent. That's why it's called the Tenderloin. I, I, I could even be Kirk. I mean, the it, fact that the CCA was there and that's why it's called the Tenderloin. <laughs> I, I had a lot of ideas of why it was called that, but they're not appropriate for a pot. I mean, that's exactly amazing. exactly. And even if we're making that up, who cares? It's a beautiful story. Go ahead and use it. I'll take I love it. it. Well said. I'm doing I love it. it. So there I, I, I got to ask too, Brian Mattingly, Chef Brian Mattingly, who I think is with Google now. You, you're going to die when you because I know he was there when you were there. Yeah, he so, was. So, so I'm in London. I'm at the Conat Hotel. And French chef, like oh, the man. second French chef that had ever been there, right? Um, it's a Gordon Ramsay place now. But back then, French chef running it. And I'm in his office, and there's all these pictures of the queen and the family and all of that. And then there's this cabinet, and it's all oak. It's beautiful. And there's a list of names. And it's every apprentice that he ever had there in 40 years had taken a knife and etched their name. Oh, that is so Into cool. this door. And guess whose name was on there? Like number four or five, Brian. Yours. Martin. Brian Mattingly. No way, was it really? Not, not mine. I might have bumped into it, but yeah. no, Brian <laughs> Mattingly. How so, cool is that? It's super. He was super. great. I mean, I learned a lot from him. That school experience was amazing. You know, I always tell people if, if you're an inspiring chef, you have to go to culinary school. Now, a lot of chefs will say, "What? That's you know, no man." But the truth is, like everything in life. You need all aspects, right? I worked in restaurants from 13 years old, right? So I had the yeah, real yeah. experience. But guess what? As you know, in a matter of 18 months, I got to drag my tongue across the globe because I'm with this chef who used to be f cooking for the United Nations. I'm with this guy. I'm with this girl. And all of a sudden, you're getting like this PhD in delicious in 18 months that would take you 20 years in the industry. So like everything in life, it's not about only doing one thing. The combination of real world experience with culinary school is mind blowing. But like everything in life, are you the guy at the front of the class going, no, make me do that meringue again. How do I get it to hold? I'm sick of when it tears and it cries. I want those peaks to stand proud. Or are you the girl in the back of the class or the guy that's like, ah, you know, I can just hang back here and the bell will ring and I'm done, you know? So it's what you take out of it. It's as well. what you put into it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well said. And and that's the advice you give your kids too. It's the journey, right? It's the path that you take. Um, speaking of London, spend some time there too with uh, a pretty well-known dude, right? Anton Moseman. I waited Unbelievable. on Prince Die. 
Princess wow. Di. Wow. I was everywhere. Every stage I did was half kitchen, half front of the house. Cause I just always believe that I want to understand the whole picture on both sides. And oh my gosh, I learned so much there. It was, it was really, I remember, was it, oh my gosh, was it Brian? I wonder, I can't remember now. There was a chef. I think it was the garbage guy. Actually, there was a chef at the CCA that helped me make the connection, but I basically wrote a letter oh. every day saying I'll work yeah. 16 hours a day for free. I'll work 16 hours a day for free. And they finally <laughs> replied and said, sure, come on over. And it was a great experience. You know, he doesn't get enough press for, for the impact that and I think he's still alive. I mean, he made an impact. Oh, he yeah. was the guy at the time. He was the first one. I mean, I think, and forgive me, whoever's listening, if I'm wrong, but I think he's the one that inspired, you know, Jean George, because he was doing those juiced, you know, vegetable sauces yes, and reductions yes. Yes. way back, way back then, you know, speaking of which, uh, chef, let, let, let's talk. Well, have you talk about how your travels not only impact kind of your, your philosophy around food, but specifically your palate and, and, and ultimately what you wanted and still want to cook. Yeah, you've been you've been question. around. You've been around. Yeah. You, yeah. you should do a podcast with like 80 plus episodes because you I should it. you and I should just talk every day. Why don't we just talk I'm in. Every day? I'm in. I'm gonna start no. cutting butter and putting it in the refrigerator. Exactly. Your wife will be like, <laughs> fall in love with you all over. You're again. good looking. Another 20 years together. No, but you know, that's the right question because like everything in life, you want to constantly you know, I always say I know nothing because I'm constantly learning. And as I drag my trunk around the globe, I'm re-inspired, re-inspired, you know, and, and what's so cool is, you know, eating is kind of like life should be, be present, you know, like take it in. I'm not worried about yesterday or tomorrow. I'm just going to be the best I can be today, whether it's what I'm cooking, eating, doing for work. And then all those great days put together is a great life. So when you're eating, it's the same thing, right? You want to be present and really think about what you're eating. Yes, there's those moments where you just got to fill that hole in your stomach and you're just, you eat so fast, like we both have. And you're like, I don't even remember what I tasted. What, what was that I ate? But the right way to eat is to be thinking about what you're eating. And when you're traveling the world and tasting, you're automatically more present. You know, when I went to Thailand and I kept tasting this taste, right? And I'm like, what is that that I'm getting? And then I finally realized it was galangal. And Galangal is like the ultimate backup singer. I mean, it is like this undertone of flavor and aroma that is so beautiful when in balance. And that inspired me to reconsider how I'm creating balance with each and every dish that I do. So it's it's those global flavors that kind of spark that flavor wick and make you think differently about how you're cooking and how to balance ingredients and how to make things. It's so clear you're a pro at talking about food. It gets me excited. Um, I don't know if my octane has been this pumped up in a while, but watching your videos, reading about you, um, the time that you competed on, um, you know, uh, next food network star. And we'll get to that in a minute. You have this, you have this really unique way, exciting way, high, high level way of not just speaking about food, but narrating what you're preparing. Like, like, the, like, like one example I saw that you, it was so simple. You had, you had some white fish in the saute pan. And, and, and I love when you're talking about heat up the pan, heat up the pan, then hit the oil, the, the fish is in the saute pan. And all you did was take a little spatula and just kind of, you just kind of lifted the fish a little bit. You could see that it broke. It's a tough one for people, right? Don't right. feed me translucent white fish. I don't want it. Right. So, so you have this, it's, it's an art, right? So I, I you're a storyteller. Let's just say that. So What's the process been like? You're a Chicago guy. You're at CIA. You went to CCA. You're opening all these restaurants. When did this like just hit you? Like, man, I'm good at, I can talk. I can talk and I could talk about food. Was there a process? Did you study more? Or is this just who, who Jeffrey's thought is? Well, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. You know, it's because I love it so much. And it's because like my goal, like whether it was on TV, I'm looking at that screen, that, that lens, and I'm not thinking that it's about me. I'm thinking I got to get in there and get to everybody because they need to know this stuff, you know? So it's, yeah. and obviously, yeah. you know, same thing. You're a chef, you're an educator, you're an entrepreneur as well. And you want to make a difference in people's lives with this stuff. But the only way you're going to do that is if you can articulate it. I mean, I'd love to to explain some impressive process, but I think it's it's partly just who I am. But what I've also done is, as I was saying earlier, like when I'm eating something, 
I really stop for a minute. I try to slow down and go, what am I tasting? Like, what's that first flavor? Well, first, even before that, as you know, if it looks good, it's going to taste good. So how's that presentation? What am I seeing? Oh, wow. Look at the crust on that. That's going to you know, change the way it tastes. How did they do this? Then I take a bite and I'm thinking about it. Where's the acidity? Where's the sweetness? Because as you know, that acid elevates all the other flavors. Is yeah, yeah. the thinner finish just bitter enough to make me die for another bite? Or is it too bitter to where I'm like, I'm starting to pucker, you know, like a wine that you shouldn't be drinking this soon. So it's it's really thinking what I do is in, I do this mind tasting and then I try to break it down into pun intended digestible parts for people so that I can help them you know, recreate the same thing. My cookbook, that was the biggest challenge is I wanted 68 pages on how to know when the onions are are the right color and texture. Right. (laughs) But of course the the publisher's like, ah, no, this recipe only gets three pages. So it's, it's about um, thinking about what it tastes like, what it looks like, and then how I share that with, with people. And it's also like, as I'm cooking, I think about like, I love my sister in Chicago. She's super passionate about food and cooking. And, you know, but so I think, what would she want to know when I'm doing this, right? Like what would be the thing that would be the tipping point for her? Like with eggs, right? I'm passionate about eggs, but it's about, as you know, you got to keep them moving light and fluffy. When they get those crispy edges, that's when the sulfur comes out and they're nasty and they dry out. You know, my wife laughs at me because residual heat is one of my favorite topics, right? (laughs) I've heard it. I've heard it. Yeah. I love it. I love it. We, we also call it carryover cooking, but residual heat, brilliant. brilliant. Yeah. More eloquent. Right. Yeah. 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 Exactly. I love that mind tasting. So, so I thought about something as you were saying that. So, from your perspective, you've got a great presence on social media. You're you're good in front of the camera and all of that. What has changed since you and I went to culinary school? We didn't have Instagram back then. Hell, we didn't have phones back then. And I see so many people, and and, and I don't mean this in a negative way because every it's all beautiful. I was at a beautiful restaurant in Chicago. Um, not too long ago. And I'm, and I'm the first one to whip out the phone and get some stuff on Insta, but I'm also, has it changed? Are people more concerned about that Insta post than what you're talking about being in the moment, experiencing that, that acid and experiencing the bitterness are, are people too hung up on, on getting it posted as quickly as possible? Because then it, you know, it's, it's evidence that you were there. I, yeah, I yeah. Worry a, I worry about that. No, it's a it's a really great point, Kirk. Right? It's like everything in life. Are you doing it because it matters to you, or are you doing it because you think you're supposed to? You know, it's it's exactly yeah. like I always say. Who could you be if you weren't who you thought you were? Right? Like everyone has an image of what they're trying to be, but who's the real you? And and you bring up a great point. You know, when I when you and I went to college school, right? People look at me like, why do you want to be a cook? That's weird. It's like you know you might as well be a ditch digger. Like who wants to be in a kitchen? And the truth is, all of us back then. You know, when I was at the CIA in New York, it was like Camp Culinary, man. I was up in the in the school's kitchen at 5 a.m. playing with eggs, and I was there at, you know, the end of the day sure. re- relearning how to sear a piece of steak that I learned all day. You did it for the sheer joy and passion. Now, I think you and I both know a significant percentage of people are doing it just because they're like, I want to be the next TV chef. I want to be the next, you know, Instagram star or social media star. And I think it's a double-edged sword because, you know, people ask me, what's your favorite wine? And I go, white Zinfandel. And they go, what? And I go, I would never drink it, but it's my favorite because it got people drinking wine. Absolutely. That's what's brilliant about it is they go, well, this is sweet and easy. Ooh. But then what happens, you start digging deeper and you start going, wow, this wine. Oh, so it opened up a whole world to people about wine. I think it's the same thing with all this social media stuff, right? It's like the downside is, are you doing it for the right reasons? And do you really care about it? But the upside is it has allowed people like you and I and all these hardworking chefs and people that are into education and, and the love of food to have a bigger platform and actually be able to make an even greater living with it. So it's it's like anything in life, right? There's some bad stuff about it, but there's some good stuff about it. And like everything, it's like, how do you find that balance? But you know, I'm really big into like a buddy of mine said it when I was partners at the Grove up in San Francisco. He's a really passionate guy. And, and he said one thing to me years ago when I was doing his menus that I loved. He said, roast me a perfect chicken and then tell me about all your fancy crap. But, you know, <laughs> it's like make me a chicken where it is retained all its juice. The skin is, the skin is super crispy. You, you literally snappingly crisp. You go through it. And then when you open up the breast, the juice starts to puddle out. That 
is really understanding food and how to cook and it's salt, pepper, and a bird. You and, know what I mean? And, and, and it's again, so simple, like a beautiful omelet or a risotto, you know, where you, where you can stop in the middle of making the risotto, pull out a, a grain of rice and crack it open and show, show the insides to a student, you, you know, God, the questions just keep coming. How has, t you know, buzzwords, right? Local sourcing, sustainability, um, better benefits. How how has all that played coming out of the pandemic into your impression and and how you speak about the industry? Well, you know, it, I started going to Europe 30 years ago and fell in love. And it's comical, right? Because if you say to them, like, you know, farm to table, local sourcing, they're like, uh, and, what else is there? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, good so point. again, good point. Yeah. I think it's great that people are becoming more and more aware of it. And I'm constantly relearning myself. You know, I have a busy sure. life. I have family. I got in the habit of running down to the local grocery store. Right. But now for the last year or so, I've been back to every Wednesday. I'm at the Santa Monica farmer's market nice. on Arizona and between, you know, second and fourth. And oh my gosh. I mean, Kirk, you know this. I get these spicy mixed greens from, you know, different farmers that I like or arugula. That stuff is standing proud. Two weeks later, if it's in your fridge, it's still good versus yeah. that plastic sealed greens that you open it up and it smells like a moldy basement or something. You're like, ooh, yeah. you know, and yeah. listen, people, everyone listening out there, you got a busy life. You can't always get to the farmer's market on a Wednesday. I get it. Or even a Saturday. But when you can it'll be so inspiring and you'll eat much better. So I guess, I guess the short answer is it hasn't changed anything for me as much as just been a constant reminder of how important it is. You know, I joke sometimes to friends and they all think I'm nuts. I'm like, wouldn't it be cool if they passed a law where you were not allowed <laughs> to have anything travel more than 30 miles. So Imagine. like you had no yeah. <laughs> choice, but to cook seasonal because it was illegal to get, you know, produce from South America in the winter or whatever, you know, I mean, it would, again, practical, probably not, but like, how cool would it be? And that's what's great about the farmer's market. Like I'm buying persimmons because that's what's in season. And then I come home and make this, you know, persimmon flan. And it was like so inspirational and so delicious because it was in season and that's, you know, what happened. So I think there's a lot to be said for doing your best to do that, you know? And, and no, I always joke, well my said. wife, my wife's like, Oh, I, I got this chicken from, I won't say the name. Cause I'm going to say something negative, but from this really popular chain, I'm like, I know it's from that change. She's like, how did you know? I'm like, cause I just tasted it. Like <laughs> let your palate tell the truth, right? If you don't believe it, go get like something that's really local and farm raised and, and good husbandry and then get something that's mass produced, taste them and you'll see the difference. I love how you're an evangelist, right? And at the end of the day, you know, Amazon will figure out how to, how to keep things within 30 miles. They'll figure it out. Right? Yeah. Well said. Well, and again, there you go with the good and the bad of yeah. big, right? That's a really good point, Kirk. I think that they could ironically be the ones that figure it out for us, which is great. Whether, whether it's a drone or, uh, you know, otherwise, you know, staying on this whole, um, I'm, I'm just fascinated by the the literacy, right? The literacy, any advice for, for a young culinarian who's, you, you know, trying to, like you say, I, I mean, you got to balance a lot of stuff today, transportation, relationships, housing, all of this stuff. Then you're coming to culinary school and you're inundated by, you know, stuff on social media and what other people are doing. And, oh, God, I forgot this. Um, any advice as they're trying to to find their voice around foods? Just just food. Just just yeah. that topic. That, that's another great question. And I think it's the most important one now per our previous you know topic. And I think the answer is do what resonates with you. Like for me, when there was that craze about all these foams and things, it never resonated with me. So I wasn't going to go, oh, I'm going to do Jeffrey's version of foam. No, it doesn't resonate with me. So be true to yourself. But the only way to be true to yourself is to be super open-minded in the beginning. I always say like, read every cookbook you can, not to copy the recipe, but read a cookbook like a novel. How do the characters yeah. interact? Ooh, look the way rosemary and pomegranate played. I like that combo. I like that flavor idea. And that's what I still do to this day. I never like copy a recipe per se, but what I do is I see this, this great thing that Kirk posted and I go, I love the way he played with cornmeal, pecans and, and catfish. I'm going to, and I just write those three words down. I have a and thing in, called yeah. in my notes on my phone. I have a thing called cook and I just write three word <laughs> combinations, flavor ideas, and then I build off of that. And then that way it becomes authentically you because you're kind of creating your own mind tasting database. You're experimenting. And then you see which lane you land in. Like for me, you know, I was at, I was at, uh, you know, uh, 
in at Anton Mosemans in, in London and I loved him and I was so inspired, but I also was like, you know what? No, I don't want to be this fancy. I yeah. want to be rustic. And that's why I went back and opened, you know, gourmet, but Mexican where it was casual and fun. That was who I was. I wanted to put gourmet flavors into a daily delivery vehicle. So that, find your lane and then just speed up. No, I love it. And, and coming, coming to that, uh, to that Mexican concept, sweet heat. What a beautiful name. What yeah, a perfect thank you. name for a restaurant. You know, it's interesting. It, what I heard was do you, right? So last night I had orientation for a bunch of new students who are starting with us online. And, and that's kind of the message. Um, it takes a while to get there, but there's no perfect way to be a great student or uh, study hard or just do you. And I, and, and I do love that. I'm probably stealing that from someone. Um, to, to echo your comments about where you get inspiration, um, cookbooks can be expensive. Um, uh, you know, coffee table books can be really expensive, but I'm just like you, whether it's Noma's new, new book or Fava Can or, or, you know, some, some, some cool Scandinavian restaurant. It's, it's about the inspiration that you get by turning the pages. I don't even need to read the recipe. I just, just that's, that's the joy. I mean, some people like golfing 18 holes every other day. Some people like, you know, jet skiing. I like to go through cookbooks. It it's it's a vice. It's terrible, but I'm I'm right there with you. You know, let's 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 get really excited here, Jeffrey, about um, you, right? This auditioning. I, I I mean, it's one thing to be a great cook. It's one thing to to be passionate about food, know where your food's coming from, be being able to talk about it. But then this 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 whole other thing where the, the, there's 13 cameras in your face. And you're sweating. I was talking to Curtis Stuffy the other day. He was on Iron Chef. And, you know, you don't see that. You don't see that, right? So so talk a little bit about the impetus of auditioning for, obviously, your personality pulled you in, but next Food Network star. Like, what's the secret to, to being authentic, but also dramatic, that they get that guy? I want that guy or I want that gal. What? Like, how do you do that? Yeah, it is. I got to tell you, I feel so blessed because it was my final exam. It was the ultimate challenge. And it was, that. as a result, the most rewarding thing. But what it was, I've been a martial artist my whole life. When I was 18 years old at Iowa State University, Master Pac stood there. He was 65 years old. And he put <laughs> his leg straight in the air and held it straight up. As he was talking to us, slowly brought it down, stuck it out back to the floor. And he said, you know what? If you get in a fight, you're not going to be able to say to the person, hey, let me stretch just a second. I'm, okay, I got to warm up. He's like, if you can't put your legs straight in the air when you're cold, you don't have a chance. Because it's extending yourself beyond your reach that allows you to then perform in an instant and be great. And I always... Love that analogy because same thing with food, right? The reason I thrived on those competition shows and I didn't know it at the time was because I had worked so hard to build that mind tasting database, to be open-minded about everything that then when all of a sudden you're under pressure, right? You said it perfectly. I will never forget being on Chopped All Stars and we got that basket. I'm standing next to Michael Simon and uh, you know these amazing chefs and I'm like, Oh my gosh. And it was no joke. They go open your baskets. And I thought after we pulled out the ingredients, you know, they'd be like, they'd shut the cameras down. You'd have a minute to think, no, go. And you've got 20 minutes to make your first course with a basket. You just opened. It was the real deal, but I loved it. It was like crack for me because it's like, this is where you get to see, have you really spent the time mind tasting? You know, when I pulled out pancake batter and chicken feet, what do you think everybody <laughs> made when they got pancake batter? Oh my God. Blinis, they made, pancakes. They made, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I just got back from cooking in China. So I made a congee, you know, the oh, rice stew. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah. put seafood and stuff in it. So I made a congee out of the pancake batter and I had the crispy chicken feet sticking out of it. And I won that one because it was like, but it was only because I had pushed myself. I had traveled and not everyone can travel. I understand, but you can travel in your mind. You can travel yeah, online yeah, sure, now. Sure, sure. Like you said, you don't even have to spend a ton of money on cookbooks because you can Google the heck out of everything and really yeah. get what you need without spending a penny. So it, it was the, so the, the very long answer to your short question is it was the ability to have done so much that I could tap into that quickly in the moment. 
it was the sheer love of it. Because if you don't really love it, when you're under pressure, you're going to crack, which I watched a lot of people do because they didn't necessarily love it. They hadn't pushed themselves really far. They didn't have a recipe or anything to re you know, to, to use as a guide. So they just start crumbling, you know, and, and ultimately, you know, you got to look at that camera as if it's your sister in Chicago, you know, you yeah. can't go, Oh my God, I'm on national TV. You got to be like, Hey sis, here's what we're doing. All right. We're putting this together and this is what we're going to do. And it was really the combination of all that, that, that made it work for me, but it was, you know, it well, was some, so some joy. of that's a gift. You're humble. I mean, some of that's a gift. I mean, not, not every, some people can really, really practice a lot and still freeze, sure. you know, sure, under. sure. I, I love, I love the quote, totally stealing it. Going to, going to, going to share it everywhere. Extend yourself beyond your reach so that you can perform in an instant. I mean, yeah. that we could be in a boardroom. <laughs> in front of students or in front of my son's baseball team. I mean, quite honestly, um, a absolutely brilliant. Um, I don't know if you can probably can't share secrets, but most interesting, least interesting about being a, a contestant on a, on a, on a show like that. The most interesting thing has nothing to do with food. It was the ability to keep calm. It was a test on your anxiety levels, your worry uh -huh. levels, your stress levels, because when you're in that environment, I mean, it's funny. A lot of people make fun of reality TV, but after being on it, sure. A lot of this stuff is, is exaggerated. Or as the editors would tell me, we can't make a, a good person look bad, but we can make a bad person look horrible, you know? Yeah, so yeah, you, yeah, you can exaggerate what's there, but they can't create it, but you have got to keep your head and that was what it was really all about. Like, I swear, it's no different than martial arts, right? I, I could beat a fighter that was better than me because I had more endurance and was calmer and was thinking in the moment and watching his pattern and what he was doing. And that was the biggest, the most rewarding, wild part of that was, was can you, it was a test of who am I as a person? And I learned to work on a lot of things after that as well. Um, the least interesting part um, is that what you said? The least interesting or the least? Yeah. Yeah. If there's anything that stands out, it was yeah. probably the sheer boredom sometimes because all the waiting and yeah. waiting, like you, me, most people in this industry are a personalities, right? You, you're, yeah. you have one speed and it's full throttle to the end. Yeah, yeah. Smoking, Go. Right. Go. So when you have to like wait around and, and, you know, that kind of stuff, it's, it's, it can be very trying. And that know? adds to the anxiety for people too. It's like, Bravo. Oh, oh my God, oh which my they God. do on purpose, by the way. Yeah. Oh, that's I'm, all sure, part of the game. I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. You know, brilliant on their part. So yeah. let, let's talk a little bit. You've owned restaurants, you've launched brands, um, you know, uh, dreams. I, I mean, you're, you're working on two things that, you, you know, every, every chef dreams about every person probably dreams about, but a couple of things jumped out that I just got to ask about. Please talk a little bit more about the magic triangle. I freaking love the magic triangle. So here he is after he put the butter in the refrigerator. He's over here in the corner. He pulls open the knife drawer and then he's and he calls it the magic triangle. I'm like, this guy's a freaking genius. Uh, well, I mean, you know, how can you take something so simple and turn it into I I have a magic triangle in my kitchen at home, by the way. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny because. You know, my first restaurant, Sweet Heat, I'm a 25-year-old guy, and I didn't know anything. I signed a lease, and then I decided, I, what, what should I make the concept be? You know, it was a narrow, teeny space. So yeah, I, yeah. I had to work in this really little kitchen. And But then I realized, like, you know, these big, fancy kitchens sometimes make it harder because, really, it's just the three-foot pivot. You want to be from sink to stove to fridge, sink to stove to fridge, right here, one, two, three – and it makes you so much more efficient, whether you're cooking professionally, trying to bang out a thousand dishes an hour, or whether you're just at home, like to have to walk, like I joke, my kitchen here, you, you probably are referring to that one video. Like I have to walk around the kind of the butcher block area to get to the fridge again, first world problems. Right. But it's not as efficient when you've got everything set up to where it's those three points, everything just flows in the kitchen more easily. And the other thing I, I did during COVID, which got a lot of traction, like the butter was open up every one of your kitchen drawers. And if there's anything in there that you have not touched in the last three weeks, get rid of it. And when I say get rid of it, you don't have to throw it away, but put it in a box, label it, put it in a lower cabinet in that corner cabinet, where, you know, your garage shelves, wherever you can access it. 
And oh my gosh, all of a sudden, you know, clean space is clean mind and it makes you so much more efficient and you realize how many wasted toys you have too. Yeah. So it's, uh, those are the little things that, you know, I always say, it's like, when you make the cooking experience more efficient, it's more fun. When it's more fun, you'll do it more often. No, I love, I, I, I love that. I'm, I'm going to actually have my wife do that in her closet. I think that's, that's, that, that's brilliant. <laughs> so, 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 um, rebel chef, rebel chef. I saw a few really cool things on rebel. Are you a rebel? Are you a rebel in the kitchen? I don't think I am, man. I think, um, you know, <laughs> I'm more of a lover than a fighter in the kitchen. I just want to bring joy. You know, it's like, you know, but I think that that rebel series was, it was a great idea, but unfortunately it was just, you know, underfunded. It didn't work out, but they really wanted to do this app where it was going to be exercise and food. And, and I had so much fun and met so many great people doing that app. And it was really about digging in and, and doing all kinds of different things. But I think rebel is a good word because it, you know, what it really means is close that book, throw the recipe away, go for it because nothing in this world worthwhile is ever easier without pain. I always tell people, if you're comfortable, you're failing because the greatest things in my life have happened when I'm sick to my stomach, when those butterflies turn into rocket fuel, that's when your life changes. So, you know, it's like be a rebel, meaning don't feel like you have to follow the recipe. I have this one friend that cooked this. We went over to her house and she goes, I knew I shouldn't have done that, but the recipe said it. I said, next time I want you to close that book and do what your gut says. Cause you were right. And you don't learn until you fail as well, right? So when you're when you're following things too carefully, it takes the joy out of it and it, it throws the energy over here instead of in the pan. So do your best to glance at the book. And again, if you're a brand new cook, of course you want to follow recipes. So you, you know, if you can't break the rules till you understand them, but don't be afraid to just go with your gut and say, you know what? I grew up in uh X place and we used X ingredients. So I'm gonna mix that in and see how that tastes with this. You know, that's where, you know. Fusion is funny cooking, right? Because my buddy said, fusion, the definition of fusion is when you insult every country involved. (laughs) That's the bad version. But the good version is how do you learn to to grab, you know, chili peppers and put them in cuisines that aren't typically spicy and create something totally new? Speaking of that and and, and kind of going back to the triangle again, any advice for pantries? I mean, pantries can be a disaster, right? Unless you're going to scrap everything, go plant-based and start from scratch. Right. Yeah. If you saw my pantry and fridge, you'd probably think I don't even cook because there's so little in there, but that's because I'm lean and mean. I don't like to, Got to stockpile and waste, you know, I mean, of course I have my different rices, my different grains because I'll cook with them, dried beans, whatever. But for the most part, open your pantry, same story. If you haven't used it in a couple of weeks, either donate it, get rid of it, or be inspired and do something with it. You know, for example, I had some baby black lentils and I'm like, these have been sitting in here for months. So, you know, I did these beautiful Moroccan style lamb chops and I put them over these baby lentils with a little bit of mint. And it was like the mint lit up the spice and it played nicely. And the lentils were creamy, but because they were so small, they were like little bursts of creaminess, these baby lentils versus a bigger starch. Yeah, yeah. So play around. But I think the pantry is about, you know, what am I going to use? What do I need? What can I clean out that I'm not using and have it be very efficient? You know, it's like, yeah. kind of like your desk, have just on your desk, what you're actually using. Well, it says a lot about your style as a cook too, right? If we're going to, if we're going to evangelize that we're buying local and and we're sourcing local and all of that, then we shouldn't have a bunch of stuff stockpiled. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm totally with you. You know, hanging on this whole, I mean, you've done a lot, any advice for, for again, young culinarians or anyone, you know, half my family listening to the podcast uh, on launching a product line? What, what, and, and I know there's a lot and I'm not trying to simplify it, but any, any quick advice on, on what to do, whether it's chutney or, you know, some, some other cool product. Yeah. You're, you're such an amazing host. You've done your homework so well. I'm a little bit and, and grateful, you know, <laughs> I mean, I would say the, the, the most important answer is that I'm probably not qualified because it's not like an expertise of mine, but what I can share is that you don't have to be an expert to make it happen. You know, I'm 25 years old and I was doing these seared scallop tacos with green chili chutney. And that's, that was the inspiration for the name sweet heat, because I just love that with every bite, you got this sweet bit of scallop and the sweet chutney. And then all of a sudden the heat kicked in and went, whoa, and it cleansed your palate and reset you for the next bite. So I made these chutneys, a red one and a green one. 
And at the time, Macy's had this amazing food seller in San Francisco. Uh, you probably remember that. Yeah, yeah. They were really yeah. well known for it. And they wouldn't return my calls, wouldn't return my calls. Okay. So I got some hot chips right out of the fryer, threw them in a bag, <laughs> left it a little bit vented so they wouldn't get soft, grabbed a bottle of chutney, got, jumped on my motorcycle, went down to Macy's, illegally parked on the sidewalk, went down to the food seller, walked straight into the buyer's office without an appointment. And I said, I am so sorry to interrupt you. I'm sure your day is busy. Can I put one thing in your mouth and I'll leave? She started <laughs> laughing. I dipped the chip into the chutney. I gave it to her. She ate it. She ordered 30 cases. And then I went to William Sonoma and I said, tell you what, you guys are doing these cooking demos. If you'll, if you'll buy my chutney, I'll do some free cooking demos to show people how to use it. Brilliant. And my restaurants, you know, right here in the neighborhood. So it's, it's kind of like ancient. I'm not making this up. Guerrilla marketing is like, you know, that was famous 30 years ago. But I, I think it's important for people to remember that like open the jar, the box, the bag, whatever you're doing, put it in somebody's mouth and get started. Because the reality is, you know, don't ever let, oh, I'm not a big merchandiser stop you from your dream. You know, at the CCA to this day, one of my favorite quotes, the CCA speaker said at our graduation was, the only difference between dreams and reality is how bad you want it. Oh, I love it. I and love I it. always love that because it's really true. Like, don't let anyone ever tell you. And I graduated and I was 24 and they're like, you got to work for other people before you open your own restaurant. I'm like, no, thanks. Now I'm doing it for sure. And I opened my restaurant, you know, I had my challenges, but we killed it. And, you know, just if you want it bad enough, you'll figure it out. I, I love that ambition. I, I, and a similar story, I've got a, a good friend here. He's, he's, he's got a little startup, uh, um, you know, hot spice company. It's called Seed Ranch. She does a great job. Super, super smart guy. We we went to lunch. Um, we both had chili. Um, you know, it was cold, cold outside. He literally pulls out, you know, a sample of his, and he literally reaches across the table and he goes, "Not now, try that chili." I mean, it's love it, right? Yeah. Brilliant, right? Perfect. So, <laughs> um, I, I I've seen a couple of other things, and and where I'm going with this sort of angle, chef, is you you can do so much more. As a chef, I mean, you're a marketer, you're a brander, you're an evangelist, you're 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 a prophet, right? Um, I, I saw some stuff on 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 infomercials for New Wave, right? Kind of a cool sort of uh, kitchen equipment, and and um and I and I think I see that you're in real estate too. How, how do you pivot constantly, and do you compromise anything by shifting back and forth, or do you? Or or, or or does it become even better? It's like, look at this guy. I mean, I believe the butter and I believe what he does with the fish and I believe the triangle and I'm, I bought into the rebel chef. So I think I'm going to try this equipment because Jeffrey said so. I mean, is, is there a, is there a method to that madness or, or is that dangerous? You know what? I've always said, like, if you look at most people who love their life and I got to tell you, if I could change one thing about my life, I wouldn't because it has been an amazing <laughs> journey, but I also could have never scripted it as you probably couldn't as most successful, happy people couldn't, they go, I could have never told you this was what the story was going to look like. So I think for me, the short answer is, and it's really a, a important question you're asking. Cause I, I, especially for younger people, I think more than ever, it's great to be a slash. I love being a slash. I'm a chef slash realtor. And I can do both really well. And it was funny because my wife's like, oh, well, you know, don't let our real estate clients, we've been doing real estate for 22 years. She's like, don't let our real estate clients know that, you know, you're, you're a professional chef and at restaurants, they're going to think you're not as good of a realtor. You know what? I sold more houses by saying, wait, what are you, you're doing Asabuku tonight? No, 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 no. First, oh dry it God. really well, season it, I... dust it with flour, but let that flour <laughs> fall off, sear it, golden, take it out, then add the tomato, da, 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 put it back. And they're like, um, can we write an offer on that? But I never asked anyone to write an offer on a house, but I connected sincerely yeah, yeah, because yeah. of my passion for this stuff. It was genuine. So, yeah. 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 And so it's, it's really about the story you tell yourself. Everything in life is the story. So if you're going to tell stories, tell good ones. And the stories I chose to tell myself <laughs> was I can be great at both. Both will help the other one. So, and the infomercials, if you would have asked me about an infomercial when I was on Food Network or when I had my restaurants, I would have said, infomercials, are you kidding? You know, that's like, what is that? That's so cheap. I'm like, I'm a, I'm a real chef. I'm a restaurant too. I'm not doing infomercials. The infomercials have been one of the greatest thing I've ever experienced because- I bet, I bet. 
Yeah. You know, you get, I meet this passionate engineer, the guy who owns New Wave, and he is so passionate about how he's engineered this air fryer to have, and he loved it because I called it a cyclone of heat, you know, because you have this cyclone of heat <laughs> swirling around and it is crisping from every angle. Like the chicken doesn't have a chance of not being perfectly crisp because it's coming from every side. And then I could take my passion for food and the way I cook. And I would think, how do I sear this at home and then put it in the convection and then broil it? Now, how is this machine accomplishing those three things that I do with three different pans making a huge mess and it's all happening in this vehicle? So I did six of those in the last few years and it was such a joy because A, I had people commenting like, oh my God, I just saw you on that, that, that. So it ties everything together. I'm proud of the products. I wouldn't do it if I didn't believe in a product because then you're like, then it would feel. And, and, and why, if you're, if, you, if you're branding a, a super, super cool product that you believe in, why wouldn't you ask a subject matter expert to talk about yeah. it? Oh, and that's what why I was thinking about them too. Yeah. That well said, Kirk, that is the most important point is, is new wave saw the importance of that. It's like, who better to to integrate what this machine can do than somebody who can taste what it does? Like I could taste the Bravo oven broiling the top. I could I could experience how after the center was moist, the top heat blasted down and gave it the sear like you and I do in a pan with high heat. I was like, yes, because you, you know? understand what's supposed to happen, right? Right. They could have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on a PR company, and they would not have come up with cyclone of heat. Yeah. And, and, yeah. Three words, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Freaking, you know, I freaking love it. I flavor love chamber, it. baby. The flavor chamber. The flavor chamber. <laughs> hey, we we've uh, I've, I've got one really important question left, but before that, what's next? What's next for you? You know, I think life is about not what happens, but about how you react. It is the only thing we actually control is we own that completely as our reaction. And I have learned. Yes, you can put it out there. I'm going to go do this and you make it happen. But what I've I've landed in such a beautiful place, being totally transparent, as you know, the kitchen hurts. Restaurants are hard, you know, but my love for food, I have to put food on the plate daily. There's not a day that goes by that I don't cook, but I've found this grateful, magical place where I can do my real estate, which funds my travels and my passion for food around the world. And then as these opportunities come, I do them. So I will let you know what comes next because I'll be all over it with all the passion in the world. But it's, you know, will I open another restaurant one day? Probably, but it'll be 20 seats. It'll say open when open, menu is what it is, welcome. You know, and I'll just be putting myself on the plate and in, in what inspires me that day because I have to vend that. But, but yeah, so we'll see. I love that. And and I want that 20 seat restaurant too. maybe 12, maybe 12. And uh, I'll send you the business plan. The name of it, Jeffrey, is chaos. And ah, no, one, I love it. no one will ever question it. Hey, I love it. That My fork's different than your fork. Welcome to chaos. That's great. <laughs> hey, the name of the podcast is The Ultimate Dish. And this is the, the, the point in the episode where we just kind of kind of ask you what what in your mind, it could be a memory. It could be uh, a specific dish, um, a, a type of cuisine, but uh, I'm really interested in hearing what the ultimate dish is. The ultimate dish for me is very personal. It is Asabuco. And the reason why is because my first restaurant, I was living above the restaurant, had my Ninja motorcycle and thought life could never get better. I had this hot <laughs> girlfriend who is now my wife. But when I found out, I met her walking down the street when I was building my restaurant. I said, that is the most beautiful woman I've ever seen in my life. I must stop and say hello. And then as we started <laughs> dating, I found out she grew up in Rome. So I'm like, oh, she's Italian. She'll appreciate asabuco. So I had her over for dinner. I made this asabuco. All of a sudden, she was quiet. I look over. She's got the wine opener, and she's digging out the bone marrow. No. And, no. And, and taking it right off the corkscrew. I'm like, that's my wife. I'm with you for the rest of my life. So for me, that dish will always be the ultimate dish because not only is it what, again, almost like the roasted chicken, it's actually a very simple dish, but when done yeah, yeah. right, it, as you know, with that glowing it's, saffron risotto that looks like perfect. the sunrise on your plate, it is. And so for me, tying in uh, the love of my life to it is that'll always be my dish. So beautifully said. I don't know. We've done about 84 or five episodes and that might be, I think you just podiumed. 
I appreciate you as podium, buddy. <laughs> you did. That was beautiful. Our our best to your beautiful family. I hope that we talk more. I have so enjoyed meeting you and chatting with you. You're you're an amazing storyteller and a super, super cool person. Feeling is mutual. You are the real deal, and that's what makes a podcast great. Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening to the Ultimate Dish Podcast brought to you by Augusta Escoffier School of Culinary Arts. Visit escoffier.edu forward slash podcast, where you'll find any materials mentioned during the podcast, including notes, links, and other resources. You can also browse other episodes and subscribe.